In traditional society, music was very much a part of daily life. As the areas were invaded and they were rounded up and carted off to the concentration camps, which were euphemistically called reserves, the effect this had on Aboriginal music was that the songs started telling stories about the destruction of society. songs that Australia produced over the last 200 years come from a period before radio and television and people entertain themselves and it was really a matter of sitting around the fire or at the plough or whatever and making up the songs and remembering the old songs and adapting them and just singing them because in those days people actually sang, they sang more. So come away me hearties, we'll roam the mountain side. Together we will plunder, together we will ride. Everyday Australians created these songs, passed them on through the family and their friends, and the songs like The Wild Colonial Boy are very important to the Australian people. In many ways, it's our unofficial national anthem because it was sung in the very early days, it was sung during the convict period. In fact, it was regarded as being treasonous if uh, the men, the convicts, actually whistled the tune. They were sort of like flogged for it. And the song went through the ages and was adopted by the working class as a, a bit of an anthem and sung, be it at country dances or around fires. And it also was uh, a song that passed into our tradition and it was said that Ned Kelly in fact knew the song. Australians tend to think of themselves as being classless but certainly back in the 1850s there were class divisions, there was a music that I suppose today we'd call folk which was just simply a mixture of popular musics of the day but there was also an enormous amount of attention being paid to social mobility upwards which meant that you also were looking for a music that would support this so the ambition probably of almost every mother in the community was to own a piano were doing. It was a cultural cringe. They were not trying to make music here that was indigenous, that was something special for us. We were not exporting what little we did actually compose. We exported the performers, the singers for example. In fact, music was being used as a way of reassuring ourselves 
that we were able to recreate the culture that we'd come from. And we will wear a tiny bloom of our strength. What a blossom we dearly love, the sweet perfume of our strength. What a blossom. New technologies introduced at the beginning of the century and increasing through into the 1920s meant really the death of amateur music because it introduced standards that the amateur could not meet. So gradually the amateur began to sit back, not perform so often and listen, become a passive audience in other words. There was also, of course, a realisation by big business elsewhere that they could exploit this market. And so we were flooded with music that came in this easy packaging and quite cheaply and supplanted what the amateur was doing at home. Australian composers are rather inhibited by the fact that uh, overseas compositions were virtually flooding the Australian market and appearing on records, piano, piano rolls and other similar forms of entertainment. And the outlet that Australian composers had for their music was contained solely within Australia. And although people like O'Hagan and Jack Lumsdain were appearing on records. These records were in a lot of cases just featuring their novelty songs. And now, the inevitable Gundagai. There's a track winding back to an old-fashioned shack along the road to Gundagai. Where the blue guns are growing and the burrow bench is flowing beneath that sun. just never had the outlets overseas. Overseas companies just didn't want to know about Australian music to the extent that they would issue Australian records. <laughs> Radio in the 1920s had a big effect on live music in Australia. People were staying home more often and the entertainment that the radio provided was virtually free. When I first came to Sydney, I joined uh, Frank Coughlin. That was uh, in the late, oh, well, it's 50 years ago now. That was in the late uh, 1939. And uh, Frank Coughlin was renowned for his uh, jazz attitude. The influences of music before the war were very restrained. People were sort of emerging from the Depression, but they wanted to enjoy themselves, and they enjoyed themselves by going out to the many dance halls, both in Melbourne, Sydney, and in Brisbane. And when the war came, uh, the whole scene seemed to change. Instead of people being re restricted, they became more relaxed, more frantic. They wanted their music with a strong rhythmic beat so that they could let themselves go and make every moment count. Well, there was an interesting thing about the recording uh, industry in uh, the early 50s. 
Uh, there was only one recording company and they had a stranglehold on the whole industry and they made it a policy only to release one hit record a month. Well, as the kids were hearing all the hit records from America, and they wanted these numbers, so the only way we could get them was to put them down on recordings, on the old acetate recording, and then uh, I took the arrangements off note for note, and we would reproduce, clone those American recordings and release them on the Australian market. Six months before the recording company got around to releasing those records. Not only did they control the uh, manufacture of records, they controlled the distribution of records and they threatened to withdraw their product from sale from those distributors who accepted the Australian records for sale. So we had the situation where not only did they refuse to produce Australian records, they refused to allow any distribution of Australian records and so we had dis distributors who then concentrated solely on Australian records and they started to find that they had a they built up a market for Australian recordings. Up until the 20s there was a almost like a parallel development going on between American country music and Australian country music but the situation changed radically because the Americans got their music recorded first and um, commercial interest entered and they, they sold that that music overseas and they sold it to Australia and so Australian audiences were hearing um, American recorded country music and um, that tended in a lot of ways just to swamp the Australian tradition, the Australian ballad. I mean it, it survived but that had the effect of really putting the lid on the development for say 15, 20 years until Australia started recording its own artists. Slim Dusty took influences such as Jimmy Rogers, the singing brakeman from the States, but when he finally emerged, he had something that could not have come in any other place in the world, and that was one of the reasons for his huge success. And the cattle moved back from the lowland When the rain tumbles down in July um, Slim's first commercial release, When the Rain Tumbled Down in July, apparently, was just a huge watershed. The people suddenly heard on the airwaves, this is a song about us. Something new there, Slim. It allowed them the room to associate their experience with a song by an Australian singing in an extraordinary Australian voice. And when the rain tumbles down in July To the sleeping gums on the hillside Awaken to her stream by From the flats where the fences have been